Well, hello people. I'm back up here on the northern end of the smallest county in Ireland, County Loud, right? And I'm just on the edge of the Cooley Peninsula, right? So, um, what am I doing today? I'm just, um, I'm going to look for a walk. I can't take the name of it at the minute, but I'll put it up on the video, right? And there's also a dolmen, dolmen, another thing with the two stones and the flat one on top. So I'm looking for that as well. So I'm just driving down this lovely road here on the edge of the Cooley Peninsula. Uh, fantastic landscape up here, hills and sheep in the fields and forests. And yeah, have a look at this, my friends. I try to face my ego every second of the day. Time to recall the reason why I can't wash away. Right people, I'm just taking a right here according to Susan from Google. I called the uh, Google voice here, Susan, right? To find this uh, dolmen. Okay, Susan, thank you very much. So I'm just going down this road here to look for this dolmen, okay? I absolutely love these roads. <laughs> love them. The twistier, the better. The narrower, the better. I love them. Stone bridge here. people I think we're here I don't know how old now this dolmen is anyway but we'll have a look I love doing this kind of stuff do you it's like tagging along yeah hope you stay anyway let's go out and investigate this dolmen okay This one looks definitely authentic, unless someone came along with a big crane and lifted the stones on top of one another here. Now this looks authentic all right. Oh, here we are, look. Wow. Look what he reckoned it was like way back. See the people and the entrance to it, look. The big, big mound on top of it. So, what's the saying here about this place? Proleak portal tomb. Uh, the megalithic tomb, large stone, 
is an example of a portal tomb, so called because the two large upright stones which support the highest end of the capstone acted as a portal or doorway into the burial chamber. The tomb may originally have had a cairn or mound of small stones surrounding it and perhaps even covering part of it. These tombs were built by farming communities in the Neolithic period probably around 3000 BC, wow, as a place to bury their dead. Burials were normally cremated before they were placed in the tomb and were often accompanied by flint and stone implements, bone beads and pins and fragments of coarse handmade pottery. Wow, so you're talking about, you're looking at something from 3000 BC here, look. And that's all that remains of it. But isn't it amazing, isn't it? Look at this. How did they, how did they get these stones up? Wow. I don't see any inscriptions on the stones. So this was obviously the way into it, look, was it? Yeah. So this was obviously the way into the tomb and it probably went in and, and in that way over here, you know what I mean? Look at the size of that stone. Put here by human hands 5,000 years ago, untouched. Oh, this is what I love about Ireland, you know what I mean? Or, and, and Europe. Uh, you know, you'll have all this um, history and stuff from way back, and it's just fantastic. Wow, very impressed by that, my friends. Fantastic. Well, I think so anyway, I don't know about you, but I'm, that just blows my mind, you know what I mean? That men, assuming it was men, maybe there was women involved as well, erected that dolmen 5,000 years ago with no machinery, no big heavy lift, lift equipment. Ah, oh. yeah, and I wouldn't have found it only for Susan. Thank you, Susan. That's what I call, call the, the Google voice on Google Maps. Susan! Right, let's go someplace else, my friend. There's a golf club out here. There's three guys out there playing golf. And fair play to them, why not? Right, people. I'm just going further into the Cooley Peninsula here and I'm looking for a place called... Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this properly. Anna, Anna Lugan Loop Walk, right? So let me just see how far this is away and see can Susan direct me to it. It's, it's only, according to Susan here, it's only nine minutes by car. So let's do that, my friends, okay? Head southeast, then turn right. Oh, Susan, she's just a lovely voice, hasn't she? She's gorgeous. Okay, Susan, I will command. Hello people, just stopped here in the, Canuli, in the Cooley Peninsula by a pub called Loopers and look at this, isn't it lovely, isn't it, look, uh, Paris whiskey and the old whiskey barrels, uh, the telephone box, telephone, Guinness is good for you and it's just lovely, look, this is the old churn, I don't know whether this, this would be for making cheese and stuff, right, and butter, I think so now. And, uh, you know, you just keep twisting it, twisting it and twirling the whole thing around, you know. Um, I love it. The old shell, look, uh, petrol pump. Very, very good. So, this, I'm in, in the Ravensdale area here of um, the Cooley Peninsula along here now. So it's really good, isn't it? I like it. Look at your man up on the 
poles are lovely. Says an important notice here. To gain access, just press 7777 on keypad on right hand side of phone box and open door after the beeps. Only enter to collect oh defibrillator. Okay. See there's a, there's a defibrillator in there. You see they don't use uh because your mobile phones now no one's using these phone boxes. But it's good that they have it here and keep it here. Nostalgic, you know. So look at this. Um, I'm going over here to just sit down. So put my tea here on a little kind of a thing here, and I got a kooky look. And I wouldn't mind. I've got a flask in my car here with tea and sandwiches. I'm after buying tea and a kooky. Hmm. And look at the. Uh, the pump, the old pump. And it's saying Tain, Tain Way here, so. Must be a hiking trail up the mountains here, look. Yeah. So you must be able to go on down that road and up into the hills and the mountains. And look at that lovely stone wall there and the little hay barn. And the old rusty horse box. Oh, it's lovely. Continue on R174 for two kilometres. Okay, Susan, I'll do that. That was a grand pit stop there, wasn't it? That's a pub called Lumpers, right? In Ravensdale here, on the edge of the Cooley Peninsula, right? And uh, I see them say a thing there, five euros to park your car all day if you're not a customer. But I, I, I thought that was unusual, but it's not unusual because the Tan Trail is there right beside that pub. So you can leave your car there and go hiking up the mountains there all day and your car is, par is parked in, in, at the, in at the back of the, the pub, which is super cool. So I must come back and do another uh, hike up, up uh, the Tan Trail there beside that pub, okay? So, uh, yeah, so I'm going on now to this other, uh, I can't pronounce it, uh, uh, the loop walk, right? So, let's do that, my friend. So, stay tuned, stay tuned, okay? Look at this, and this lovely. What's that there? Someone's little thing in the house, yeah? You probably just can't see it on the GoPro there, but I was looking back towards uh, Dundalk Town there. So that's it my friends. Right people, I made it to the place I wanted to go to today in the Cooley Peninsula, right? Now I'm not pronouncing this properly but I'll pull it up on the video. Anna Lagu Loop Walk, okay? Now, apart from the fantastic views that I'm going to see here, there's a particular reason why I come up here and if I find a reason, it'll be the first to know, okay? And see my friends, okay? So stay tuned, okay? Let's do this walk. Ah. Oh. Look at that view, my friends. Isn't that just out of this world? Look. See the lovely green fields and there's sheep in the fields and the hills. And there's sheep further up on the, on the hills or the mountains, if you want to call them there. It's just so picturesque. And the reason why the grass is so green and why the keep calling Ireland the Emerald Isle is because of all the rain we get, you know what I mean? But when you have a dry day, you get this, you know what I mean? Spectacular views. Well, let's do this walk, my friends.
Now people, it's not just fantastic. Look, I'm looking down on the landscape here with the hills, our mountains, and our sheep in the fields here, the little country roads, twisty and thorny, and the individual houses and the farms. And over there is Dundalk Bay, and um, Dundalk is where, my fi where I'm pointing my finger here, the town of Dundalk. That's the most northernest town in Southern Ireland, on the east coast before you cross the border into Northern Ireland. And out here, my friends, is the Irish Sea. So I'll just keep walking. I still haven't found this particular uh, thing that I've come up here. If I can't find it, I can't find it because the walk in itself is just spectacular, right? But uh, I hope I find it to show you, right? So stay tuned. people see here now I'm looking southeast here out there is the Irish Sea and I can see all the way back to the Dublin mountains way way in that direction there so Dublin is in that direction over there okay and as I said over there is the town of Dundalk But I'm going in the right direction anyway, because there's the arrow pointing this way. And as uh, you two say in one of their songs, and I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I hope I find it, my friends, to show you this. Because if I find it, um, I will be chuffed, okay? So stay tuned. Okay, this way now. Bit of climbing to do. Whew. Right, so it's telling me to go, as you can see there, slightly to the left and over that ridge up here. Whew. It better be here what I'm looking for, my friends. It better be here, but I'm still enjoying this walk in nature. Oh, the stone wall's great, look. All hand done, obviously. From way back, just take the stones off the, the mountain and stack them one on top of the other. And you get a nice stone wall. Right. Keep going up this way, my friends. A bit tough going, but I'll just go take my time. Right people, I think I found what I came up here to look for and I can tell you this much, it's not very well signposted, only for I looked in the distance and seen it. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show you this now, okay? So stay tuned. Right people. I'm standing, standing here on a very tragic site on the Cooley Mountains here, right? It was a, a plane crash going back in 1942, 
right? Now I think, I'm not looking at the shore now, this is a British Lancaster bomber, look. You see it there, look, model of it. It's say that's a British thing there, right? And there's bullets, obviously. Right, so, it crashed up here in bad weather and 19 men died in this crash, okay? Um, and I'll just read a letter that one of the survivors wrote to um, the father of one of the men who lost their life on this tragedy here, right? So he says, we ran into worst weather. I, I rave ever experienced in three years of flying. It was almost impossible to see our own wingtips. We all knew we should require a good deal of wireless assistance if we hoped to get down safely. Then the real trouble began. The wireless operator could not contact any station in England because of some fault in the wireless equipment due to the weather condition. We knew we were over England and we lost height to 2,000 feet in order to enable us to pinpoint our exact position. But the weather was just as bad at 2,000 feet. It would have been unwise to down any further because of barrage balloons or mountains. So we climbed up again and cruised around hoping uh, for the weather to clear. But it did not. Instead, it became even worse. By the time we had been in the air over 15 hours and we were carrying fuel, uh, the captain immediately dived down over the lights, which we knew was Dublin, and circled around at above 500 feet. About this time, two of our four engines ceased running and we were unable to climb very well. The captain then headed straight along the coast of Era to try to land at an aerodrome in North Ireland. We had been flying for about half an hour after leaving the lights and all this time we were gradually losing height. There was a terrific crash and when I awoke I found myself lying about 20 yards from the machine which by this time was practically burnt out. I tried to stand up but couldn't. As I found later in hospital, I had fractured my spine in two places. I managed to crawl around in a sort of daze and soon saw there was not much I could do for any of the other chaps in my condition. So I crawled over the mountainside to look for help, but there was no one in sight. I started to crawl back to the machine but fell unconscious before I got there. I woke up while being carried down the mountain on a stretcher and found that we were not discovered until three hours had elapsed. This display is mounted on a crankshaft from one of the four engines that powered the plane. It was retrieved from this site in the 90s and refurbished to have its conrods moving freely. It still has one of its 14 pistons attached. So look at this, these are all the names of the of the poor lads that died in the crash. Richard, Richard John Wells, Francis Charles, all here, look, first names, the last names. The pilot. They got Distinguished Flying Cross, REF, look. Killed, 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 killed. That's a Royal Canadian Air Force, and Royal Canadian Air Force. So maybe there was two Royal Canadian Air Force people on the plane. So, it's, it's the worst crash in Ireland's history and it took place on the 16th of March 1942. So, that was definitely during the Second World War, right? So, this is what did he say was the crankshaft of... Um, from what, this is the crankshaft of one of the four engines they're looking at here, look. Okay, look at one of the pistons here, look. Sometimes things happen beyond your control As if they have a life of their own The choices you make, what appears to be right Seems you just have no say As if you're a witness And your own as you can see, strewn around here on the land since 1942, 
is part of the the crash plane. Look, you see that? So sad, isn't it? Like, I wasn't even shot down, you know what I mean? It was bad weather. Um, 19 men lost their lives just here. Just right here, my friends, okay? In 1942. So I'm glad I found it. This is what I came up to, to, to look for. I'll tell you one thing, it's very, very hard to find it. Very hard, only for I happen to look in the distance and see this little thing sticking up in the air. I was going to dismiss it and I'm glad I didn't. Just go over here now, something else over here. Lancaster to me now. In memory of the 15 pilots who lost their lives on board Liberator AL 577, which crashed here on the 16th of March 1942. I must check that up now. Um, if the Liberator is a uh, was an English plane. Maybe that was an American plane. But it ha it's, 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 to me, it looks like the Royal, the Royal Navy um, insignia that was on it there. But um, yeah, sad, isn't it? Um, but there you go, my friends. Right, so that's what I come up for, my friends. Hope you enjoy that now, even though it's very, very sad. But uh, all that. Uh, time ago during the Second World War and um, parts of the plane are still here on the mountain it must have been terrible it must be like fog or they, they would they'd no radar on, on on the on the plane obviously to tell them there were there was high terrain you know and then they were losing height anyway because they only had two engines. reading here right I'm just wondering um, like what was going on here because look is, is that there to me now look is that uh, it's RAAF Royal like Royal Air Force just Royal Air Force what's this here Royal AAF and now I know this here is the Royal Canadian Air Force so there's two from the Royal, Royal Canadian Air Force one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine from the Royal Air Force. But what is the RAAF? So look, yeah, so there was pilots on it. Look, look, there was a pilot, an air gunner. So there was one, two, three, four pilots, an engineer, a co-pilot, two navigators. So... I wonder where, where they're going, like, you know what I mean? But anyway, that is a sad, sad um, thing, isn't it? Like, you know, just right here, 19 men lost their lives in 19, on the 16th of March, 1942, the worst air crash ever in Ireland. Okay, hope you enjoyed that, my friends. I know it's um, sad, but uh, I wanted to find that, and I was very, very hard to find it. So it's up here in the Cooley Mountains and I'll put the name of this loop walk up on the video if you want to try and come here and find it yourselves, okay? Hello people, I'm just popping into the video here because um, I was fascinated by um, this crash site and I was wondering why was there 
19 airmen on that um, RAF American built World War II bomber. And what were they doing in the middle of the Second World War, flying up the east coast of Ireland with, you know what I mean, uh, what, what the hell was going on, right? So anyway, let's start with uh, the plane first. So the plane is a B-24 Liberator bomber, okay? There was 19,000 of them built during the Second World War. Uh, the main manufacturing place was in Detroit in America, right? And um, it was a long-range bomber, and it could um, hold 8,000 pounds of bombs in its bomb bay, okay? And, uh, yeah, so... The, so the first the first people to use this bomber wasn't the Americans, it was the British. So I think they got 10 of them at first, right? And they used them to fly <coughs> long distance missions into the into the Atlantic because there was the menace of the German U-boats were blown up merchant shipping, bringing, you know, valuable stuff over to the Allies to fight the Germans, right? So what they done was this Liberator bomber, the RAF got them and they were, and they were very successful at, uh, I don't know, dropping down these is it special bombs that can blow up the U-boats. So that's what, it, what initially they were used for. And then the British were using um, uh, uh, their own bomber called the Wellington, right? So then they got um, the Liberator, okay? And let me just see here now. I'll just, I'll just, go, I'll just go on here and tell you, right? So, anyway, so the RAF 108 squadron, it was called, right, had been serving in North Africa, engaging in bombing uh, campaigns. And in December 1941, the RAF decided to switch from the Wellington bombers to the American-built Consolidated Liberator. Okay, that's the top, that's this this plane here that crashed above and, uh, the Cooley Mountains. And its initial success soon led to the entire squadron swapping to the plane. Okay, and uh, here's a picture of the plane here. Uh, the B-24, and this plane replaced the Boeing 7, well, it didn't replace it, but it was, it, it was, it was uh, more superior than the Boeing 17, which would be, probably be the most famous of the bombers of World War II, okay? Uh, so, Liberator AL-577 of 108 Squadron, headquarters in the Middle East, took off from Egypt at 16.55 hours on the 15th of March 1942. The destination would take them over the Mediterranean and France to RAF Horn in Dorset, England. Right, so I looked up RAF Horn on Google Maps, right? And I couldn't find it on the maps, but it was, it was shown like... Um, Bournemouth Airport, you know, present-day Bournemouth, Bournemouth Airport. So I'm just wondering, back in 1942, was RAF Horn where present-day Bournemouth Airport is? Or maybe it's still there, but I, I, I couldn't see it on Google Maps. I could see Bournemouth uh, Civil Airport, you know what I mean? Yeah, so anyway. There were 19, 19 men with full kit on board. A six-man crew operated the plane, carrying 13 passengers from the same squadron. In all, the plane held six pilots, three navigators, three wireless operators, air gunners, and one mechanic. The men were from the English, Scottish, Australian, Canadian, and New Zealander forces. So then it, it says, it's saying here then that shortly after flying over the French coast towards England, the crew experienced their first problems. Reports suggest the plane was ordered to return to Egypt due to bad weather, bad weather over the British Isles. These orders were acknowledged. Veering off course in the bad weather, the plane ended up flying over the east coast of Ireland. The crew saw city lights, believed it to be Dublin, and set course for RAF Greencastle in County Down, as they were by then short of fuel. 
the American bomber crashed at Schlieven o'clock on the Cooley Peninsula near Dundalk around 14.10 hours on the 16th of March 1942. And, uh, <clears throat> and it just says here that um, two of the, there was four survivors, right? Two of them was um, pilots actually. But according to this here, it wasn't the pilots that were flying the plane. There were passenger pilots. So there's a sergeant, uh, passenger pilot, RAF, survived. And flying officer, James, James Robert, flying officer, a passenger pilot. Uh, he had a distinguished flying cross with the RAF. And he survived. So, yeah. Um, and uh, a wireless operator, a gunner. REF, he survived. So anyway, people, um, that's it. I just thought I'd, I'd, I was just wondering why was there 19 airmen on this bomber from different nationalities, from Allied forces, on that plane? What, was the, what were they doing? So basically, they were sent to fly back to REF Horn to collect more of these Liberator bombers and fly them all the way back to... I presume it was in Egypt, although the British had had another base in um, Cyprus too. But I think those liberators flew out of, uh, obviously, RAF Horan in England. I think they had a base in Italy and they had a base in um, Egypt. And this plane, this plane that crashed up here, this plane had done three bombing missions in North Africa. I think it was, I know Benghazi, they bombed Benghazi, so you're talking present-day Libya there, right? So the, the Germans were in North Africa. So it had already done three bombing missions, and then that particular plane was the one that was being sent with all those crew members to fly back to England, which would have been a dangerous mission in itself to try and get 15 hours of flying, and they were meant to collect new planes and fly them all the way back out to, I presume it was Egypt, right? Maybe it was Cyprus, but I'm just saying Egypt, right? So not only did they lose that plane up there, but that was a big loss for them because look at all those pilots that was, you know, that was killed there. So that that's it, people. So back to the video, okay? Take care. Like, from where I'm standing here now, like, if you just think back to the 16th of March, 1942, when this four-engine piston Liberator bomber, unfortunately due to bad weather, crashed up here. You can see how they ended up over here. They were losing height because they only had two engines, right? But you see, see the mountain here, this one here, and that one over there. So they must have came right through here, right through the middle of those two hills, and just crashed over there. So sad, my friends. So, so sad. Um, in war times and they weren't even shot down by the enemy their enemy enemy <coughs> was the weather and uh, not being able to get in contact with the wireless um, God you call it wireless operator couldn't get in contact with the ground uh, this is messy here I have to go through here look I'll go over here. Now. Yeah, once again, my friends, that's very, very sad. I'm so glad I found it, but it's very, very hard to find. Okay. Let's go back to the car. And, um, I'll have a cup of tea and a sandwich, okay? So stay tuned, my friends. Right, people, I think I'm almost back at my car now, right? And um, do you know something? I didn't meet one person on this walk, not one person, right? And see where I am now, look. If I just stop talking here for two seconds, it's just silent. Listen to the silence, if you can. the stillness. Now that's what you call peace of mind, my friends. Get out in nature. I keep saying it. 
Get out in nature, my friends. Get away from all the hustle and bustle and turning on. I, and I'm guilty of it. I've been on TikTok there watching that tr atrocity in the Middle East and it was just getting me down, down, down. Every single day, depressed and angry. And um, you have to try and, I don't know, just get away from it and hope all that gets resolved somehow. I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, get out in nature, my friends. It's just great therapy, I'm telling you now. It really is. Okay, back to the car for the tea. So stay tuned. people just having a cup of tea here ah, that's grand and I bought some turkey sandwiches right so I know something I've, my t-shirt on me here is absolutely soaking you think I was out in the middle of a monsoon after that walk so I must remember in future if I'm going for big hikes to bring an extra t-shirt or something and change it when you, when, when you finish the hike uh, yeah so look this is turkey sandwiches brown bread from um, Lidl uh, Hove's granary bread they, that, that's a great bread if you're making sandwiches right and a nice cup of tea from my flask and I'm sitting here looking out at this fantastic view and there's not one person around and it's lovely and quiet Mmm. Just can't beat it, my friends. You just can't beat it. <sighs> right, people. So that's it from my hiking adventure in the Cooley Mountains on the analog something loop I'll pull up on the video here and they visited that um, sad memorial to those um, 19 young aviators who lost their lives up up here in uh, on the mountain top in the 16th of March 1942 um, so I hope you all enjoyed it my friends and Stay tuned till the end. I'll put up some pictures, and um, what's what do I usually say? <laughs> uh, yeah, so stay tuned, my friends. Uh, for the videos, are normally up on a Sunday. So press the notification bell to know when they're up. They're normally up on a Sunday between 5 p.m. and after 5 p.m. And if you like the video, just press the like. And if you're new to the channel, please press subscribe. It's free, okay? And. Uh, as usual, I've no idea where my next video is going to come from, my friends, but it's going to come from somewhere. So stay tuned. Okay, bye. I'm going to enjoy finishing my sandwiches here in quietness in this beautiful surrounding here in the Cooley Peninsula. Take care, my friends. Bye.